Nehemiah chapter 8 today, and you say, well, what happened to 7? We'll touch on that. And uh, we're going to roll right along here and have a good time this morning, talking about God's masterwork in Nehemiah chapter 8. And uh, I want you to get this thought in your spirit today. I want you to grasp this, understand this. I want you to live by this. The Bible is just not a book of history, as many people think that it is. It's a living book given to change the lives of those who read it. Well, preacher, the Bible hasn't changed my life. You're probably not reading it then. <laughs> you need to read God's Word. You need to apply God's Word. You need to live by God's Word. A strong emphasis on God's Word is the primary mark of a spiritual revival. And actually, that's what happens here in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8 shows us basically four marks of spiritual renewal that is related to, connected to, a part of God's Word. And I gave them to you. I think they're in your study guide. And, uh, but I'll just touch on those briefly, simply by bullet form. Number one, for spiritual renewal, God's people must read His Word. I'm going to tell you, you need to read God's Word. You say, well, I listen to it on my cell phone or I've got it on my iPad. Fine, as long as you are. I think it's important that you just not hear it. I think you really need to read it. I think reading it, it really gets in you greater because... It just makes a difference. Take my word for it. Secondly, spiritual renewal, God's people must reverently hear His Word. You've got to hear what God's Word says to you so that you can be in a position of applying it to your heart and your life. Thirdly, for spiritual renewal, God's Word must be taught. So Bible teachers must be accurate, clear, and applied to the life. Also, Bible teaching today requires commitment. So in order today for the Bible to have an effect upon your life, you've got to read it. You've got to not only, uh, you know, I believe it's important that you read the right word. Amen. Now, I know there are many versions and so forth, and there are even some what I call perversions out there of the Bible. But, uh, you know, I found the King James works perfectly, beautifully, wonderfully, and I love reading that poetic writing. And uh, so, you know, it's important that you not just read it, that you just not hear it, but that you apply it. Fourthly, for spiritual renewal, God's people must respond to God's Word. So, what does the Word say about that? To not to be a hearer only, but to be a what? Doer of the Word also. So, the, the subject in Nehemiah, when we get to chapter 8, it just really reeks and leads to a place of what is necessary in the lives of you and I, and that's revival. So, when we say the word revival for the church... I know you have maybe a lot of different images that uh, may come to your mind pertaining to that particular subject. The idea of revival may, you, may make you think about something like a tent meeting. I remember back in the days of earlier ministry in Appomattox, we'd set up a big old tent, had a great big old army tent that we borrowed, and uh, Clyde Litchwood would bring a truckload of sawdust and throw it on the floor. We ran some lights from uh, Eula Ferguson's house to the tent, and we asked everybody, please do not go to the toilet because every time you would flush the toilet, the lights would dim way down. <laughs> that was some memories, man. We, I tell you, we had some meetings, and it was really odd because, well, it wasn't odd. It was just interesting that these guys, these country guys would show up in the pickup truck. They would circle the camp, so to speak, the tent, let down their tailgates and sit on the tailgate. We had folding chairs. You know, we had all the components of what we would call the old tent meeting days. And it was a lot of fun. Wool white shirt. You had to roll your sleeves up to your elbow. You know, these are all the little necessary things. Maybe you remember some of those days and maybe some of you even did some of those revival meetings that we had. We even did some out back here in the church. It was a lot of fun. Maybe we'll do it again. I don't have a tent, but uh, we'll borrow one and do something anyway. And it'll have a, and have a lot of fun doing it. You know, uh, then there are those special events and things that happen around churches that remind us of revival days. And if you're a historian, you may remember or think about some of the first and second great awakenings that brought about great change and revival in the land. If you would draw your attention today, uh, maybe uh, you would think about a certain preacher, a revivalist. I mean, you know, uh, my dad was saved under Billy Sunday when uh, he came to town and over at uh, Miller Park. And he was saved in a tent meeting that they had where Billy Sunday was preaching a meeting here in Lynchburg. Amazing. It's interesting that what constitutes revival in the minds and the thoughts of people today, what really grasps their attention. I think a good way, you know, we think of many ways to define or 
label revival. And I think one of the greatest ways to say it in a very simplistic term is revival is when God shows up. Amen. Amen. When God shows up, well, actually, his presence is already there. We just need to recognize it and let God do the work that he desires to do in our hearts and our lives. Today, we're looking into Nehemiah chapter 8, and uh, we will see that God's showing up with his people, and he's doing something miraculous. Now, in Nehemiah 8 is a revival that was sparked by, what, a return to God's word. You know, I, I, I see happening so much in the uh, atmosphere of the church today there's not a cleaving to the word, there's a departing from the word. We're using many different types of programs and things and self-help programs and how to bait your hook and how to catch fish and how to work on your computer, but we're not teaching people the word of God. And I think it's important today, uh, you can learn all that stuff on your own time. Outside of church, you need to learn God's word inside of church. And learn how to equip yourself and to be a stronger Christian for the kingdom of God. So here we see what happened to the people. They had been through a great time of oppression. But the question for you today, uh, you know, we're going to talk about Nehemiah. We're going to talk about the people. We're going to talk about what happened there. But let's talk about us for a moment today. Let's do it by the means of a question today or two. Is your relationship with Jesus only confined to a Sunday morning? Uh, is that pretty much your spiritual life? You just... You're with Jesus on Sunday morning, but boy, when you walk out to church, after church is over, you kind of leave Jesus sitting in the pew. And that's not the way it should be. Is, is there a real biblical substance in your life every day that brings you to the place that you need to serve God? Understand this today. The Bible is not a book just about self-help for religious people. And that's the way a lot of people look at it. The Bible is actually the foundation, the bedrock of our Christian faith. And if we are not using the Bible as that foundation in which we build our lives upon, we're totally missing the point. So the Bible is meant to be an authority in your life. And therefore, you can take God's word and it becomes authority. So how do you get the devil off your back? You submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Right? Right? And, and so you've got to use, and even you go to Ephesians 6, and Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How can you fend off the attacks of the world, the flesh, the devil, and everything else that you go through? Your best, your best way to go today is with the Word of God. So God will use His Word to change your life. And, and I'm glad of that today. It's just not the process that God brings you into the family by the process of salvation and he saves your soul. But man, it's more to live in than just being saved. That's where the living starts. That's where it begins. But there's a lot of living after that process. So Nehemiah chapter 8 is a pivotal point in the book of Nehemiah. What we see is God's people returning to God's word. You know, let's get it straight here. When you return to God's word, you're actually returning to God, aren't you? So it's God using that to spark a revival amongst the people. First, before we step today forward and see what God has for us, I want you to step back a moment with me. And let's capture what has happened up to this point. And I'll just give that to you uh, in a capsule today. Chapter 1, we see Nehemiah, who's the, the cupbearer. To King Arsurses, and Nehemiah was there because the people of Israel had been in captivity in Babylon. It had been a tough time. You know why the people were in captivity? Because they had disobeyed God. Right. Every time Israel got in trouble, it's because they walked away from the God that who had provided for them. So Babylon had been captured by what is called the Medes and the Persians. And while Nehemiah was serving the king, Artaxerxes, he received news about Jerusalem that the walls were torn down, the gates had been, of course, burned. Now, Nehemiah heard this, and he, the Bible says that he wept. Two things that he did. He wept and he prayed. So the first thing is he gets in touch with God and he fasts and he sought the Lord. Listen, when you become broken before the Lord, that's when God can really move in your life. And folks, we need to almost stay broken all the time before God, for God to mightily use us. So Nehemiah was granted permission by the king to go along with the remnant to depart and, of course, to repair the walls and to rehang the gates. Now, of course, the walls were important, and we've talked somewhat about that. The walls were important from the process of protection, but there was another meaning, and I've kind of reserved this for you, and I'll let the, let the cat out the bag right now. 
Uh, not only was those walls for protection, but we find the walls were symbolic of the power of that city's God. So the, the walls reflected the power of God in that city upon the people. So when people looked upon Jerusalem, they saw a city that lie in ruin, and it gave the impression that the God of Israel was weak. Well, let me tell you right now, God has never been weak. Our God is a great and mighty God, isn't he? Amen. So Nehemiah saw that as a reproach upon God. See, he wasn't looking so much to himself, the people. He was looking at the impression that this made upon the God of heaven. So Nehemiah was passionate. This is a real important word, passionate. We need that word in our lives. He was passionate about restoring the glory that was due to God and that was, would be by the process of rebuilding the walls. So Nehemiah went and he faced opposition, we know, and we've read about that. But he built the wall, he repaired the gates, and he did it in 52 days. A record feat. I mean, this man was absolutely amazing. But you know what? We all can be amazing for God when we rely and put our faith and confidence in the power of God working in our lives. Many of us think, well, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament, and the New Testament God is different than the God of today. No, God said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. So if that God is all of that, he can, he can move mountains. He today can provide miracles in our lives. If today we will come humbly before him, seek him, live for him, and love him, and surrender ourselves to him. So when we get to chapter 7, I'm just going to give you a little morsel here on chapter 7. We find three things. One, we find the wall is completed. We find that, of course, the gates have been rehung. And then second, we, we see that Nehemiah does something. He begins to bring order to the city. There had been chaos. And thirdly, God puts it on his heart to take a census. Now, the rebuilding process for Jerusalem didn't stop with the walls being repaired. It wasn't just... Hey guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate your hard work. Now you can go on back and do what you've been doing. No, it was a process that God had brought them to, to a greater process that he wanted to work in their hearts. So if the city of Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt, the hearts of the people would have to be rebuilt also on God. I contend today the church needs a rebuilding. Not bigger buildings, not new pews, not new carpets, not new steeples. What we need today is a, is a God that who is always with us to rebuild us by his power and his might that we can be usable for his kingdom. So there needed to be a revival amongst the people. I contend today, all Christians need a revival. Amen. 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 So a revival just doesn't happen because the building was built. Revival happens when people hear first. Secondly, when they understand and then when they respond to God's word. Now, we're going into Nehemiah 8, and I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and we're going to skip down to 5 through 6, and then 8 through 12. So just buckle your seat belts, read along, and follow on the screen. I think Tom's got scripture on the screen for you this morning. And this is what the word of God says. And some real interesting things happen here. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. See, there's unity there into the street that was before the water gate, and that's not what happened in D.C., so don't connect Richard Nixon with this. <laughs> and, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street, that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. My Lord, we can hardly get people to stay in church for an hour and a half. Yeah. Amen. They went from, I mean, morning till midday. Glory. Before the men and the women and those that could, could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now, down to verse 5 and 6. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. It's simply he was just on a higher place where he could be heard. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Man, that's a powerful word, isn't it? And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up of their hands. And they, 
and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Man, that's when God's presence has moved on the people. Amen. We need that today. We need that in our church. We need that, that in our lives today. Now go down to verse 8 through 12. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is a Tashata, and Ezra, the priest and scribe and the Levite that taught the people. Tashata means like a respected position I, uh, as far as that. So that's what he's referring to there when he called him the Tashata. And Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not nor weep. For the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, mm, and send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We hear that term and the preacher may say something and, you know, or we hear or, or whatever. The word, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And we just, come, we just come unglued. We don't even know what we come in unglued about. <laughs> You've got to understand what is happening here for it to be applicable to what you are praising God about. Amen. Amen. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, holy, your, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way. To eat, to drink, and to send portions, and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Now, here's some points for you here real quick. We've got to move aggressive here. The first aspect of revival today is the hearing of God's word. So, Israel is a man like Nehemiah. He was a transplanted Jew. Ezra was a scribe. He was a priest. He was skilled in the law of Moses. He set his heart to do. He set his heart also not only to do, but to know and to teach the law of God. So the book of the law of Moses, we know that. Let's put it in terms we can grasp. The first five books of the Old Testament, we know as the Torah. Was, was a set of scrolls containing the first five books that, of course, God had given Moses for the people. Now, it was significant because... Over the 70 years of exile they had been in in Babylon, most of the people never had the chance to hear from the scrolls. And there was a reason for that. They were not allowed to practice their religious ways or to read from the Torah. So they had to conform to this new country that they were living in. Therefore, hallelujah, therefore they were forced to practice the religious practices of that country. So they were not given the opportunity to practice the Torah. The people wanted Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. They wanted, they had a desire. They had a passion. They wanted to hear the word of God. So if they were going to build the foundation of the city, they wanted to build on the word of God. Now that's real important today because when you're building a house, you've got to build. I grew up in a building family. So when you're going to build a house, you've got to build on the right foundation, right? And even the Bible relates to that about building your life. You build on the sinking sands of this world. And, of course, the winds and the waves and the things of life come along and it destroys it. If you build on the rock, who is the rock? The rock is Jesus, right? When you build on the right foundation, you can withstand all the trials and troubles and problems, headaches and heartaches that you'll face in life. Because when you build on Jesus, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Thank God. So you've got to build your house. You've got to build on the right foundation first. You've got to ensure the foundation is stable. We, we, we've really got to learn to build our homes and our families today on God and his word. If we omit the word of God, and that's why our nation is in the mess that it is in today, is that we have failed to build our homes, our lives, and our families on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Amen. So the people that had gathered at the water gate, and it was for all people. It was not for some people. Thank God, I'm glad his grace is for all people today. Amen. Amen. So the, the meeting was for everyone because the word of God is for everyone. God leaves no one out. Hallelujah. 
I'm glad today that his salvation can reach any person at any place they are in life. And that's the power of our God. So this is so true today. God's word is for everyone because when you look at God's word today, we all have the same need to hear God's word in our life. Not only for salvation, but for strength, for help, for guidance, you name it. For direction, we need the direction of God in our life. So today the word of God is very easily accessible. And that's a great blessing to us. It's interesting that the people came through the Watergate. No, they didn't go to Washington, D.C. and go to the Watergate Hotel. Richard Nixon wasn't around then. <laughs> <laughs> Have you learned that one yet? Amen. <laughs> the Watergate in Jerusalem was a gate where, of course, the wells were. Mm -hmm. So the people are thirsty. What are they thirsty for? They're thirsty for the Word of God. The living water. How thirsty are you today for the living water? Jesus is our water. Yes. Amen. And when you drink of this fountain, like he told the Samaritan woman, you'll never thirst again. Amen. So today, like the people we see in Nehemiah, we too should have the same thirst for God's word, shouldn't we? Hallelujah. We have an unprecedented access to the well of living water today that never runs dry, that is called the Word of God. Unfortunately, so many Christians only drink at the well of God once a week. <laughs> and uh, we are a thirsty people, but we do not frequent the well of living water as we should. The people came with a specific attitude. And I think that's important. The people came ready and hungry to hear the word of God. Had you come to church this morning ready and hungry to hear the word of God? I hope so. Amen. The people were attentive, but they also stood in reverence to God's word. Now, the people came with three things. They came, one, with fresh ears. <laughs> fresh ears. Fresh ears? Yeah. They came with fresh ears. See, hearing the word of God was a refreshing to them to even hear it. Secondly, they came with expectant hearts. They came expecting God to do something. Had you come to church this morning? Well, I came, I want to hear that guy, that tall Mississippi boy sing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And his tall son. I, I came to hear what he has to say. Listen today. We, and I have too, but I have not just come to hear that. I've come with an expectant heart that God's going to move through Jason, his son, and that God's going to move on our hearts and our lives today. Amen. 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 Thirdly, came with proper reverence. You need to reverence God. You'll reverence his house when you learn to reverence him. Mm -hmm. The people response was what then? You do these three things, what then comes out of that? Worship. Worship comes out of that. The people's response was then in worship. They were not worshiping the book, but they were worshiping the God of the universe that was the book. He is the Word of God. Amen. So we are to hold the Bible in the highest regard today. Respect God's Word. When we, when we as a church, we gather together, we worship and we hear the Word of the Lord. I'm glad this church, we still preach the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, as long as I'm in this pulpit, it'll be that way. Amen. Amen. This thing of, of this new gospel that we're hearing from churches today is despicable. Yep. There's no power in it. That's right. You're appealing to the flesh. And it's not going to work. I can pump your flesh up, but you know what? By the time you get to your car, your flesh is going to be right back in the sewer that it came out of. Amen. You need to be built up in God, strengthened in Him. You can face the trials of life and face them with God on your side. Amen. Hallelujah. So when we come together to worship, we do it with a heart of wanting to, desiring to. So worship God in spirit and in truth. That's what Jesus told the woman at the Samaritan well, or the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. So the Bible is at the very center of our worship. So if the Bible is at the center of our worship, then the Bible better be at the center of our life, right? Amen. So just because we, we have and we read a Bible today, it does not mean today all your troubles are going to go away. But it gives you a guide to get through those places and those times in your life. Second, revival comes when the people understand God's Word. 
So the Word of God was being explained to the people. That's what we stand in this pulpit every Sunday and do. We've been on the book of Romans for some time, a major part of this year. And, uh, and I, I tell you, it's been a wealth of information, a plethora of things that God has poured into our spirit through the book of Romans. And there's been some tough stuff we've had to deal with. And we got some more tough stuff to deal with. But man, if you'll stay with it, if you'll stay in the Word and let God's Word dwell in you today, it's going to produce an awesome results in your life. Amen. So the leaders understood God's Word and they had a, a heart to help others understand. God's Word is meant to be understood. I hear people say, well, I just can't understand God's Word. Well, read it. Study it. Get to know the author of it. And you'll be amazed how much you can understand. So if we have the knowledge and understanding, then we can take that and put it into practical use, right? So the Word of God is designed to change. Hear me. The Word of God is designed to change who we are. Third point. Revival comes when we respond to the Word of God. The people wept when they heard the Word of God. Amen. That's awesome. They were understanding their sin. And so they could see the consequences of their sins in their lives. The people wept because the word of God had intervened in their hearts. And that created and caused the change. Hebrews 4 and 12. I love this. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. <clears throat> excuse me. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of their hearts. God's word will expose every thought and intention in our life. You can't hide it from God. He knows it all. He sees it all. We've, we've, we've come to the realization that we are all broken and, uh, and that the Word of God is our reviver. It revives our hearts, it heals our lives, and it comforts us. Amen. We do not have to be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what Nehemiah is putting before us. So when you hear those words again, think of it in the context that it was intended for. That the joy of the Lord is your strength. You don't have to be grieved. You don't have to be grieved by your sins and your struggles and your problems, your heartaches, your headaches, and the world's condition and everything else. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Amen. So when we become broken even over our sins, and that's what's happening in our nation today. People are not broken over their sins. That's what's happening in churches. They're not broken over their sins. So God will heal our broken heart, and he will heal our wounds today. Amen. So God's a God who does not leave his people broken. That's shouting ground. Amen. Let me try that again. Think about it. God is a God who does not leave his people broken. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good. I knew you had some life in you. <laughs> if we will confess our sins, he will heal us of our sins, won't he? First John 4 and 9. We can rejoice for God's doing a great work among us. Now, the people in Nehemiah, let me give you a couple of points here, and I'm almost through. One, they understand, they understood rather, who God was. Do you understand who God is? Secondly, they understood who they were. That's real important. And third, they understood what God was doing in their midst. Amen. You know, God wants to do something awesome in our lives in this church. He wants to do something awesome here today. Are you ready for what God wants to do? I said, are you ready for what God wants to do here today? Because of these three things today, they could grasp the fact today, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm glad today that we have that strength that resides and lives within us. Revival will come among God's people when they hear, understand, and respond to the word of God. Now, you can today apply these things, and you may ask, well, Persia, how do I apply this to my life? Four little quick bullets for you. I think they're in your study guide. If not, you can write them down sometime or another. Are we hearing God's Word? Are you hearing God's Word? Are you listening today to what God's speaking to you? Are you letting God apply that to your life? Second today, do you understand God's Word? You've got to understand what God's trying to speak to you. Third, 
How are you responding to what God and what you hear and understand? Are you just hearing it, understanding it, but it just stays idle in your life? That's not the way it's intended to be. God puts his word in you to create an atmosphere of work that he wants to do in your life. Fourth, revival starts when the heart it starts in the heart of an individual. Today, God will work in your life and it will work in individually. Each of us say, I just pray the Lord will move in this church. Yeah, move in us individually. That's how he will move. Amen. Amen. So make Jesus and the word of God your priority today. If there's going to be revival amongst God's people, if there's going to be a movement, we, we can't do it without the word. We've got to have the word of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the spirit of God. And we've got to be willing today to let God move in our life. Make Jesus and the word of God your priority and see what God will do in your life. And the church said, Amen. praise the Lord. Go ahead, give him a praise. He's worthy of it. Well, Father, we come before your presence and we thank you for the time that we've had today to share your word. Thank you today for those who are coming in. And I just pray for a mighty manifestation of the spirit of God in this place today. Pray that, Lord, you will move on us. We open our hearts and our lives today. We just want you to, Lord, have your will and your way in here. I pray for any lost they will get saved. If those are drifting away from the fold, God, I pray you'll bring them back. Lord, for whatever need, for sorrow, for sickness, for sadness, whatever is facing God's people today, I'm glad we have a God that can meet every need of our life. I just pray today, the Lord, and bless you, praise you, thank you for all that you're doing, you're going to do, and what you've got in store for us here today. May the name of the Lord be exalted in the house of the Lord by the people of God. And may your word go forth today with great power and great authority. And may you be honored today in the company of your people. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's servants say it. Amen. Amen. Give him one more round of thanks today.